intensity and volume, uh, or what the Felicia Song now calling extensity, transparency, and so on, which all contribute to bland and the creation of orchestral layers and so on. Um, instrumentation orchestration treatises basically are example-based re recipe books. So and so use these combinations of instruments and you gave that effect, and you move on to the next example, it's example, example, example. And so young composers and orchestrators basically have to learn by example and sort of put all those different examples in their head and slowly come up with some ideas about how things work. So basically, instrumentation is looking at the properties, possibilities, and constraints and uses of a given instrument, whereas what I call orchestration is really now the combination of instruments at different pitches and dynamics to achieve a particular sonic goal that one is trying to get at. So orchestration can be as diverse as creating new timbres through blending of instruments, uh, creating a trajectory of increasing instrumental power, 
contrasting different sections through changes in uh, instrumentation, uh, bouncing antecedent and consequent quasi, uh, phrases among different uh, instrumental choirs, integrating different instruments into a homogeneous texture, or distinguishing the melodic and rhythmic materials that they carry through timbral distinction, and so on. And we'll come to all of these in a moment. So uh, basically, what we're trying to look for if you want to develop a theory uh, is a search for implicit theory that you might find in orchestration treatises or writings on orchestration and in the scores themselves. And by implicit, I mean that it's not explicitly stated as such, but you have to go and find it in there. They're using these things, okay, but they're not actually saying what the thing is by itself. Uh, so for example, if you sit in an orchestration class and a student presents a score to a teacher and the teacher says, that is an error of orchestration. Well, error with respect to what? That means the teacher has in their own mind something that this is being compared to, and that's what I mean by implicit theory. They know how things work to a certain extent, and so it's that thing we're trying to discover through scores and through treatises and then through perceptual experiments. So how would one go about developing elements for a theory of orchestration? Well, first of all, uh, we want to complement all this with perceptual experimentation. So if we come up with ideas about how things work, we want to test whether they actually work in people's perception, because then it's effective use of, of orchestration. And to build a theory of orchestration practice on the basis of all these things, perceptual and cognitive processes, we want to look at perceptual organization processes that are based on timbre and which give rise to timbre, uh, various timbral properties of sounds and their concurrent and sequential combinations, because these are the results of orchestration practice. Also, the way different uh, timbral properties contribute to things like attention, and memory and the apprehension of larger scale forms so that they play a role as form bearing elements in music. And also, can we learn to perceive timbre relations so that you can take timbre relations and use those as musical material and transform those relations in the way you would do with pitch and with rhythm and so on. So our, our aim is basically to try to formalize all of these things on the basis of underlying perceptual and cognitive processes. But true theory should be predictive, okay, in a scientific sense of the word, and so hopefully Doing this kind of thing will not be prescriptive. It will actually allow for the development of new possibilities uh, that people can use these things as tools for thought in orchestration. So today we're going to focus primarily on our starting point in this project, which are perceptual grouping processes that are related to timbre, because we feel this is one of the main, main aims of orchestration, combining and contrasting instruments and instrument groups, and for which there is a significant background of perceptual research that we can use as a starting point. So obviously, what I'm going to talk about today doesn't cover everything that goes on in orchestration, which composers do, but it's a solid place to start developing a psychological foundation for an orchestration theory, which asks, why do certain things work? So auditory grouping processes. I want to, first of all, emphasize that uh, we have a very tight relationship between analyzing music and doing perceptual experimentation, which is, I think, one of the interesting things about this particular approach. So. Um, Analysis of scores and treatises and so on uh, that are related to auditory grouping principles, these things show up. And so in terms of auditory scene analysis, auditory grouping processes organize the concurrent grouping, okay, uh, which is the perceptual grouping of things into events, we form events this way. And what sounds are grouped together into musical events, and this kind of grouping then determines uh, whether they are uh, con connected into musical streams and sequential grouping on the basis of various kinds of continuity. I'm sorry, the colors are not showing up here to help distinguish these things. And then also how listeners chunk event streams into musical units, such as motifs or phrases or even uh, themes and sections. Um, timbre emerges from the perceptual fusion okay, of acoustical components into a single auditory event. So things that create fusion or blend, as musicians would say, give rise to timbre. But then timbre affects other things that are going on in the sequential uh, grouping, because we would then group things on the basis of timbral continuity. <coughs> And we would sec separate or segregate things on the basis of timbral discontinuity. Uh, the, in, the concurrent and sequential group can work together to create things like textural integration and also stratification of the formation of various orchestral layers. And orchestral layers are distinguished in terms of their relative prominence, so the foreground and background layers, for example. Um, we also know that timbre can create segmental grouping, so sudden changes in timbre, like sudden changes in register or dynamics. Uh, and tent density and things like that can also uh, create contrasts of various kinds, orchestral contrasts. And then continuity of those kinds of things can actually be used to create larger scale progressive orchestration gestures and so on. Um, so let's look at some of the analysis categories that we derive from these different kinds of grouping. Uh, we've developed with Megan Goodchild a taxonomy orchestration devices that are based on grouping. 
So first of all, with concurrent grouping, whether things blend together or not, and this is not black and white, it's not either blended or unblended, all the categories I'm going to talk about are relative. You can have more or less degrees of blend, and composers are going to seek to play with those things. If they want something very strongly done, they have to make certain choices. If they want no blend whatsoever, they have to make certain choices. But they might want things in the middle as well, where it's sort of not completely clear. Uh, sequential grouping, okay, they either have integration or segregation of events that are happening one after the other into different streams, auditory streams, as Al Gregor would call them. And then we have the integration of these two things into, uh, uh, or interaction of these two things in textual integration and then the stratification into orchestral layers. In terms of uh, segmental grouping, uh, we have general timbral contrasts, which create boundaries of some kind. Antiphonal contrast, where we're changing instrument groups with call and response kinds of things. Uh, we can have timbral echoes. One instrument plays, another plays, it seems further away based on the timbral differences. Uh, we can have what we call the, the hot potato or the timbral chain, where a particular pattern is passed around from different instruments. So there is the actual change in timbre that's creating part of the, uh, the syntax of the music at that point. And of course, large scale instrumentation changes can be used to create sectional boundaries. Uh, segmental grouping that is based more on continuity, we have things like progressive orchestration, and there we would include various things like Klangfarbe and Melodien, where we're trying to actually create continuities along timbre uh, in one approach to that, or timbre modulation in that particular case. We'll come to some of these examples. Uh, now, a segmental grouping that has a sort of mixture of the two would be the creation of orchestral gestures, so these are larger scale kinds of things, and I'll talk about them where you're either adding in instruments or taking them away over time, and this can be happening either gradually or in a sudden manner. And that's a lot of work that Megan Goodchild has done, for example. Okay, so um, now let's go on uh, to the next area. Uh, we're going to talk about concurrent grouping and blend. So perceptual fusion results uh, in the formation of auditory events. Okay, this is how events get formed, uh, perceptually. And event formation, which depends on concurrent grouping principles, such as do things start and stop at the same time? Are they in a harmonic relationship? Are they changing in parallel in amplitude and frequency? These are all factors that can be programmed into the music uh, that can actually make things blend together, including multiple different sources blending in to create virtual sound sources that are combinations of instruments, for example. Uh, but fusion can also depend on not only that, but also on spectral uh, relations. So for example, the spectral overlap between constituent events uh, which Sven Amin and Lenka has looked at a lot, and all the overall spectral density. So you can create sound masses by having things that are so dense, you get a single sort of event, but you can't hear in it, hear out all the different sound sources. So you think of uh, Ligeti's uh, Atmosfera, for example, that's a good case of where you're getting very strong blend based on density and spectral overlap. So the auditory attributes, pitch, timbre, position, and space, and so on, are computed from these different event properties. So a grouping, therefore, precedes the attribute computation or extraction, so timbre depends on concurrent grouping in this sense. Now here's an example of blend, for example, in uh, this piece by uh, Debussy in La Mer. And basically in this particular case, starting from the second measure on the screen here, you basically have a melody, which you can barely see there, uh, where you have an English horn playing the solo, and then it is sort of reinforced, <coughs> blended together with two solo celli, which kind of uh, change the timbre of that particular instrument. And so let's have a listen to this in its context with a background layer where there's a bunch of violins and other strings playing. <coughs> Chevy and the English one, they're sort of fusing together into a single virtual sound source. Uh, one of the classic examples of this, which I'm not going to play, is the Bolero, who uh, is a rebel doing Bolero, who at measure number 248 starts piling up instruments in a harmonic series, so the octave and the fifth, the double octave and the third, and so on. And in this particular passage here, it's the French horn playing uh, the fundamental, and then the piccolo, and the celesta, and the piccolo, and the celesta. And they start and they stop together, and they have these harmonic relations, and they pay in perfect parallelism, and they do crescendo and decrescendo at the same time. So these are all the different kinds of principles uh, that basically create virtual sound sources that are being used at the same time. Uh, in blend perception, we've done an experiment I'd like to talk about very briefly. Uh, our aim was to try to understand the conditions under which instruments blend together 
uh, more or less strongly in real musical excerpts. Uh, so we had to blend in the sense of the perceptual fusion uh, into a single sound image. And we selected 64 excerpts out of a number of analyses we've done with various blend strengths and various combinations of the different instrumental choirs with strings, woodwind, brass, combinations of strings and woodwind, strings and brass, woodwind and brass were all together. And there's another category where we had some percussion showed up as well. And these were all rendered in full context in uh, the Orcsin environment, which is an orchestral simulator, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And we only extracted the instruments that are included in the blend. So for example, in the Debussy example, we have only pulled out the English horn and the two celli, because we're only interested in that particular layer where the blend is actually going on. And we would look at that separately from the rest of the musical context. Uh, of course, other experiments later, we'll put that back into context to see how that affects things. So we're interested in the type of blend. So was it an emergent blend or an augmentation blend, which I won't go into the details there. The tangible categories, which I mentioned, the different uh, orchestral choirs that are involved, the number of instrumental parts, was there two or five or 20, and so on, and the degree of parallelism of the different instruments that are playing. Are they perfectly parallel? Are they oblique? Are they similar motion, and so on. We had two different kinds of ratings. Okay, one was a unity or multiplicity rating. So are you hearing a single thing or multiple things? And people rated that for each of the excerpts and a single thing. And the strings and brass alone are rated as more unitary than uh, in combination with other instruments. And also the woodwinds alone are perceived as more multiple than either the strings or brass. And that's not really surprising because there's more heterogeneity tonally in woodwinds than there are in the other instrument families. And the type of blend, whether things it's sort of an augmentation or an emergent blend, uh, this is a notion that Greg Sandell came up with. An augmentation is where you have like the English horn there was the primary instrument and it's being modified by the other instruments. So we would call that a sort of an augmentation blend in that particular case. Or an emergent blend is you can't really tell which instrument's playing. There's not a dominant one. They all sort of fuse together and create a completely new virtual instrument, if you will. Uh, percussion instruments tend to make more tangible combinations, less unified. Okay, and this fits with some other work that we've done with Damien Talbieu uh, uh, at, uh, at IRCOM. The other kind of rating we used was a blend or no blend rating. It sound that some people were actually uh, things that we felt were very strongly blended. They were still calling multiple because they could hear that there were many instruments. So we tried another scale, which is a blend or no blend scale. And here, strings, woodwinds, and their combinations are rated as more blended than other combinations of instruments. Okay, and the difference with the unity multiplicity ratings is that primarily due to the higher degrees of blend we're being judged for the woodwind combinations than with the multi unity multiplicity. So this is an interesting notion because it suggests that the combinations can be perceived as multiple and still be perceived as blended in a musical sense. Okay, so this is a, it's not just purely fusion in that sense. The notion of musical blend is a little bit more complicated than simply perceptual fusion all by itself. <coughs> So let's move on to sequential grouping. Here, sounds from the same sound source tend to be similar in timbre that get connected together over time. So sequential integration is auditory stream formation. Uh, sounds with different timbres tend to come from different sound sources, so they go separated into separate streams. And perceptual organization does connect similar sounds into auditory streams. That's the sort of its aim as a sort of evolutionary uh, adaptation in our case. And so timbre differentiation can cause stream segregation because usually different timbres signal different sound sources and you want to connect things that come from the same sound source together. Uh, and we know that the degree of the differentiation can actually be predicted from timbre space studies. So that's where the work on pure timbre perception can come in and play a role in helping us predict what's going to happen at the level of auditory organization. So auditory streaming processes uh, that connect sequential events of similar acoustic properties, and these can be based on things like spectral continuity, which could be either pitch continuity or timbre continuity or both, intensity continuity or dynamics, and then spatial continuity. So things that are discontinuous are going to get segregated, and things that are continuous are going to be more integrated. So in our, in our terms, for our analysis purposes, we define segregation as involving clearly distinguishable voices with nearly equivalent prominence or salience, so usually in contrapuntal kinds of settings. And they're often scored, in this case, with free, with, with independent rhythmic lines and melodic lines in that particular case. Uh, segregated lines or parts can be either an individual instrument, okay, so one instrument playing against another instrument, but a segregated stream can actually be a blended set of instruments as well, if they're all playing perfectly in parallel in that sense. 
Uh, here's an example of some segregation, and this is actually a, a simulation done with uh, OrcSim, uh, taken from the Symphonie Fantastique, the Berlioz. And so you basically have a segregation here between the bassoon line playing uh, eighth note uh, staccato passage there, <coughs> and then the strings which are playing at a slower level with more sustained notes. The string's not all playing in perfectly parallel, but it's the rhythmic continuity and the harmonic uh, continuity that are actually making those blend into a separate kind of a, a string in that particular case. Okay, let's move on to the interaction of the two uh, with textual integration and stratification. Textual integration is the case where you have two or more instruments with different material, of contrasting with really melodic figures, but they are integrated into a single texture, so it becomes very difficult to hear them apart and your attention sort of flits back and forth between them. So you know there's multiple things, but they still seem to form something, a unit that goes together. So it's somewhere between segregation and integration in this particular case. Uh, and they're perceived as more in a single instrument, just like I just said. Um, but then again, the, the idea here is that we've got some kind of integration that's going on, and it's usually the context that's going to define that kind of a thing. Stratification itself is where we have a creation of two or more layers of musical material. Okay, and these are separated into more or less common strands. So you have things like uh, foreground, middle ground, and background. And it's the actual timbral properties that determine what's in the foreground. So more salient timbres are going to be foreground, less salient timbres are going to be in the background. And stratified layers can also have more than one instrument playing in them. So we have some textual integration, for example, in one of the layers is a possibility. Here's an example with both of those. So we have a foreground layer uh, down here with the violins on the bottom. Okay, playing the main melody up fairly high. And we have a middle ground layer, which is a sort of a pattern which is the flutes and clarinets uh, with 16th note and 8th note triplets just sort of winding through each other. And those get integrated into a kind of a texture itself in the middle ground. And then we have in the background uh, some horns, uh, some brass and harp that are playing in the background. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the uh, middle ground textual integration thing that's actually providing you from uh, the Moldau, from uh, Smetana, this sort of shimmering on the water uh, that's created by the, the flutes and the clarinets. that helps sort of integrate the flutes and the clarinets, not only their registral difference with everything else, but all the fact that your attention is probably more often drawn to the violins, and so you're paying less attention to the, the textually integrated part there as well. Uh, so let's move on now to segmental grouping with contrasts. And to our knowledge, there's been no experimental work on this, so we're planning a whole series of experiments to explore this a bit further. Uh, here we basically look at any kind of acoustic discontinuity can provoke some kind of segmentation, including timbral discontinuity, and this has been shown by Irene Duliege in some of her work back in the 80s, where changes in timbre can cause segmentation of the chunk in sequences, as can changes in pitch and dynamics and so on. And uh, she also looked at the larger scale sections of music that are formed on the basis of sudden changes in instrumentation or register or texture as well. And so timbre there can play a strong role in the creation of these. So timbre change can create boundaries, and timbre similarity allows you to sort of group things together into sections. So it's when you have continuity, you're creating a section, then you have a sudden change that creates a boundary, and you create differentiation with the things that follow, which then themselves are similar, and you create more sections. So it's this play between similarity and difference that actually creates boundaries in those cases, which is a perceptual property. Uh, one example of that are antiphonal contrasts. So here we have antiphonal sections that are kind of a call and response kind of motif uh, or phrase structure. And in this case, we each alternate a musical chunk of some kind is scored with different instrumentation. So you're basically taking the call of one instrumentation and the response of another. This can go back and forth uh, quite a few times in general. Here's an example from the Franck's uh, Symphony in D minor, uh, which I'll uh, start playing a little bit in a minute. And there's some boxes that are going to show up that are in beautiful colors that you won't be able to see. So you just have to imagine and just pay attention more to this thing going between uh, basically the, uh, the brass and then between the women's and strings, alternating that change in timbre there. 
actually having the chemical changes go on there as well. Uh, moving on now to uh, segmental grouping, uh, cases of continuity here, progressive orchestration. Uh, one thing we're very much interested in is the use of Klangfarbe and Melody. And I'm basically focusing on Webernian kinds of Klangfarbe Melody, which were more Melody-like, rather than the Schoenbergian notion of Klangfarbe Melody, which we're actually calling timbral modulation, which is a little bit different. So for us, a sound pillar melody is actually a succession of tone pillars, analogous to pitches in a melody in this particular case. And in our sense, it serves a melodic function, which means that you basically need timbral changes to be small enough so you actually connect things together. Okay, so if you want timbral melodic continuity, you have to have small changes in timbre, small changes in pitch, otherwise you get fragmentation, and sometimes Weber uses quite a bit of fragmentation when he wants a pointillistic kind of thing. But for me, that's less of a Klangfarben melody than a Klangfarben Sachschraubung or something. So here's a, one, a beautiful example of Klangfarbe melody out of a piece by Roger Reynolds called uh, The Angel of Death. And in this particular case, uh, he actually has this in two different instrumentations. So I'm going to first play the version uh, on piano. If I can actually get the... instruments, it's going to pass from instrument to instrument, but he also uses techniques of pedaling, because you have the pedal in the piano, so he has certain instruments holding their notes, which creates the effect of the pedaling as we had in the piano. <laughs> quite another dimension to that particular thing when you then have it moving through all the different instruments there. Uh, moving on down to uh, orchestral contrasts, um, basically uh, orchestral gestures. Megan has come up with a kind of theory of gestures where she has basically the time course, is it gradual or sudden? Uh, the direction, is it adding instruments or taking instruments away over time? And so she came up with this uh, group of basic, four basic categories of orchestral gestures. And uh, she came up with a, a technique of actually doing that, which you can't see the colors here. So basically, these are stacked bars so that you have uh, one color would be the strings, another color is the woodwinds, another color is the brass, and then percussion or organ or whatever, uh, which you kind of hard to see there. And then you can see in this particular case, this is a sudden reduction that's going on here. This is from uh, uh, the planets uh, Uranus by uh, Holst. And so in this particular case, you can see that the instruments, there's a lot of instruments, and then suddenly there's a drop off to very few instruments in that. And what you see in the diagram here is the ratings of emotional intensity by musician subjects and by non-musician subjects. So you can see it follows fairly closely here. But you'll notice there's this kind of lingering effect. When it all cuts off, there's a lingering of high emotional intensity. It's followed more by the non-musicians, but it actually begins to increase due to the kind of harmonic structure and the tension created by this sudden uh, thing that's left over here. Uh, she also adds on top of that something that's related to event density. So you can see how event density is also playing into this uh, contrast here. Uh, and also things like the actual uh, contour. So you have the high pitch and the lowest pitches there. So you can see the range of pitches that are being covered uh, changes over time as well. In addition to various performance-based variables such as the tempo. So we have a tempo drop off. We have a sudden change in loudness going on there and also a change in the spectral centroid or the brightness over time. And so she's looking at how all these contribute together to the actual uh, perception of these different things. So I'll listen to one little uh, area here, so you can hear how the sudden change goes from one down to the low part, but you'll notice it's the certain aspects of this, what's left over, create this kind of a lingering effect. I have to turn this down just a bit because uh, Holst really gets rolling here. <laughs> 
actually holding the tension there because of the harmony and the kind of use of the instruments in that particular case. So now I want to look very quickly at our approach to analysis. Um, so basically from musical information retrieval uh, research, we know that human annotation, annotations of audio, for example, are the gold standard, but they are also not perfect. Uh, basically, concepts can may or may not be clearly defined, so that's one of the things we're trying to do is define our analysis concepts. Uh, they may not fit the content of the audio file in some cases in audio analysis. Uh, in our case, it might not necessarily fit the score. Uh, there are several possible possibilities for each uh, kind of annotation that might go on, and also the annotation, the annotators themselves, if they're doing it for too long, may lose concentration. Uh, so some of the best practices that are going on is this is to use cross-validation, okay, where you have corrections by a second annotator, or the same thing is actually annotated by two people, and then they compare, uh, and then you then make decisions about the reliability of the annotation, uh, whether or not it's reliable, whether or not it needs reanalysis, and then depositions and rules might actually be needed and we actually can refine our categories, our analysis categories as we go along based on cases where people are not agreeing on what the actual analysis is itself. Uh, so in our case we have teams of annotators which are usually composers, music theorists, or musicologists working in pairs. And so they each analyze a given piece or movement for all these different kinds of techniques that I've already listed for you in our taxonomy. And then they get together afterwards and they compare that and they keep notes about what they're doing and they upload all these files to a server and they put their annotations on a PDF page. And then they compare their analyses and they try to come to a consensus about that. Although there are cases where two people didn't agree and we realize there's some cases where it might be this or it might be that. So for example, is it a segregation or is it a stratification in terms of layers, for example? There's some fuzzy boundaries between some of these categories and so we leave those kinds of ambiguities actually in the annotations themselves. And then we get together with group analyses of all the pairs to try to compare notes on what's going on and strategies people are using for analyses so that we can actually refine the analysis system so it becomes very systematic. So this is really in the, the realm of systematic musicology in that sense. Uh, these all then go into a database that we're developing, which is called the, or the Orchestration Analysis and Research Database, or ORCHARD, which we call it uh, uh, for short. And up to this point, we've analyzed about 85 movements from the, the orchestral repertoire from the high classical period to the early 20th century. So basically from Haydn to Vaughan Williams. Uh, and we've found about 4,400 different uh, uh, instances of these various kinds of perceptual grouping categories in those. Uh, the design of the database is that it's an expandable relational database. Okay, it's based on the Postgres. And it's got indexing in a search engine that's done with Solar, Apache Solar and then a various uh, a web application server that's done in Django so that people can actually uh, get in and work with the thing. And the functionality is we can have both simple and complex queries searching for examples of things in the database. So for example, I want to have what are all the cases where the trumpet is combined with something else and it creates a strong blend, for example. And you would go through the database and pull up all the uh, situations in different pieces, measure X to measure Y, where that kind of a thing is actually going on. So then we can actually go look at the music in that case. Uh, we have uh, the annotated scores that come up with these things and also sound clips uh, from the commercial recordings that we've been using in our analyses. And I want to stress that people are not allowed to not analyze scores all by themselves. They have to be doing it with respect to at least two different performances because we want to know just because you see it in the score doesn't necessarily mean you're going to hear it. So are people actually producing it in real life performances and does what sense, in what sense are some of these effects really fragile to performance interpretation? Because you might find one orchestra does it and the other one doesn't. This one is blended, the other was segregated, and so on. So that tells us a lot about how performance practice also plays a role in the actual creation of these uh, different orchestral effects. Um, so once we've got all that, we can sort of filter and do kinds of queries, and we have a query builder. So here's an example. Uh, for example, we're looking for uh, three types of effects with a strength that's at least it's greater than three in the three different, different movements. And I want the composers to be either Mahler or Mussorgsky, and the date range of the piece has to be between 1821 and 1927, and so on and so forth. So you can actually select the different types of effects based on the categories that I've told you about. You can select composers, you can select the kinds of things you want, the strength of the effect, and so on and so forth. And then it would go through and come up with various uh, examples. And so it would give you a list of things. I want to show one here. So for this particular string rating three of a certain kind, of either a segregation or a progressive orchestration or a contrast, it came up with a whole list of them, and one of them was in the uh, second movement of the second symphony uh, by Mahler, for example. 
And then you can go, when you click on those, it goes in and it shows you the score. It shows you the annotations, where that actually exists. And you can listen to the sound clip just of that particular effect right there. So you can actually then study the score and the thing once you've pulled up all these. And we're now developing things where you can then save all that into a, a sort of a work file that you're doing, sort of like you have when you go to Amazon, you have your little cart that you can put it in. So you can put all your analyses, the results you get in a little cart, and then you can save them to a hard disk to examine later if you want. Uh, so a few concluding thoughts here. Uh, timbre through orchestration has a bunch of different musical functions that we're interested in. Uh, first of all, it arises from perceptual fusion. So anything that creates fusion is a way of creating timbre. So this is an indication to composers who want to do that. And the qualities then that come out of this, like the timbre qualities, are going to be based on the emergent acoustic properties of what actually gets blended together. Uh, timbre can distinguish voices in uh, polyphonic textures, for example. Uh, it can be used to underscore various contrastive structures, and it can also provide sectional structure through large-scale changes in instrumentation. Uh, it can distinguish different orchestral layers, so the timbres themselves, you need similarity of timbres to cohere into a layer, and you need differentiation between timbres to separate layers, and the actual timbres themselves decide whether it is a foreground or a middle ground or a background kind of uh, timbre, in addition to other parameters like register and so on. Um, it can also contribute to the building of large-scale orchestral gestures, as I've shown with some of Megan's work here. So auditory grouping processes are the, the basis. That's the point we started in. The reason we do that is because we know that perceptual properties depend on the way things get grouped together. Okay, So if you want to understand the perceptual properties, which is what you're aiming at in music, you need to know how you get there by composing with these different auditory grouping mechanisms. Those perceptual properties then acquire musical functions Okay, uh, in the way they're used in the piece of music. And it's that musical function then that is going to decide for us, uh, uh, help us develop a psychological foundation uh, for a theory of orchestration in this particular case. <coughs> so I'm perfectly aware uh, that I haven't addressed several important aspects of orchestration, uh, such as why certain instruments are chosen for the character of a good passage, or how they underscore the formal processes of the music, or even why certain combinations of timbres are used to evoke a desired emotional tone. One thinks of the solo English horn melody in the third act of Tristan, or the nationalistic majesty of the brass in the of Finlandia, for example. Uh, but one thing I hope to have communicated is that music analysis cannot be confined to pitch and duration, just as discussions of painting cannot be confined themselves to forms and brightness. Uh, and timbre is not simply cosmetic, as Kaiser already mentioned. It's not musical lip gloss and eyeshadow. Or as the otherwise brilliant music theorist Leonard Meyer calls it, a secondary musical parameter. <laughs> Tampa can be a powerful structuring force and a vehicle for musical expression and emotion that is realized through orchestration. And it depends on all the perceptual processes that give rise to sonic richness. Thank you. several people very much interested in the spatial aspect of things. Uh, because you know, sometimes uh, there's different or organizations of symphony orchestras in the European and North American traditions sometimes, and one of the things we're interested in, does that change the way things actually blend together? And if the, the tube is way over here and the contrabassoon is way over there, can you actually get them to blend together because of that spatial differentiation? Uh, and it's even more crucial when you get into mixed music, where you've got uh, sort of sources that are loudspeakers, uh, creating electroacoustic sound that you're trying to blend with uh, acoustic instruments that are on stage. And it's not only the spatial differences between them, but also the kinds of directional possibilities of each instrument. I mean, loudspeakers have their own kind of directionality to it, and that couples with the room very differently than do musical instruments which can actually move and things like that. So this is something we want to look at, but I don't know anybody who's studied it yet. Uh, but sound recording engineers play a lot of attention to that particular last thing, but in a very intuitive way. So. One question one might ask are what are the principles that one might come up with about those things? Um, so I'm going to use 
maybe one, one question. Uh, what, what is the ultimate goal of such a theory of arbitration? In the beginning, you said that it's not only meant to be prescriptive, uh, but what does that mean? Uh, it's the ultimate goal, something like a parametric <coughs> model of uh, how to translate creative ideas into arbitration. And would such a parametric model be, not be somehow contradictory to the idea that orchestration is part of the creative uh, process and that, for example, we ought to recognize composers from their way how they orchestrate? Mm -hmm. I think there's always going to be individuality in these things as well. Yeah. The real thing for us is a question of the following. First of all, why do things work? Okay. We have lists of, oh, this works, that doesn't work, so on and so forth. You look at orchestration trees, it's like that. And nobody ever talks about why. Okay, so the one thing is, why do things work? Because then once you've got principles about why, and you can teach young orchestrators, if you do this, this, and this, then you can create that particular effect. It doesn't tell them what effect they should go look for, or try to create, but it gives them tools for thought to achieve the things they're trying to get at. Okay? And that then contributes, but at that point, then they develop their individuality and orchestration. And it's very true that you can look at these different aspects of, uh, you can recognize often on the radio, turn on the radio and very quickly you know, oh, that's Mahler or that's Beethoven or something like that. Um, and there, uh, the notion of timbral identity and orchestration style, I think, is a very, very interesting question that we hope to look at with some historical analyses and so on, uh, which I think our database will allow us to do once we can actually get uh, machine-readable scores into that. So at the moment we just have the annotations, what people say about the thing, once we can get the scores in there, we can start mining that kind of data and finding these things. And one question that uh, one of my colleagues, John Rea, who's a composer working on this project, says is that he thinks there's actually two kinds of things that need to be looked at. One he calls timbre, the big T, is basically the distribution of the different pitches in the different registers and so on. It's like the interval structure of things. And timbre with a little t is then the instruments that get put on those. And so we're trying to imagine how can we test this kind of an idea. And he thinks that he can recognize basically composers primarily on the big T part and less on the little t part. I'm not completely convinced by that, but it would be interesting to do some experiments and see what are the different factors that are actually playing a role there. But I think for me, it's basically tools for thought about how to achieve your aims. It doesn't tell you what to achieve. It tells you how to get to where you want to get to. So that's the sense of how I think orchestration could be, orchestration theory could actually help people learn to orchestrate in a more efficient manner. It takes years and years and years because they just have to memorize thousands and thousands of examples. And if, if there are sort of basic thought processes, I think it might speed it up a little bit. That's the dream, you know. It might not be ready, but that's the dream. Just the acquisition. Yeah. In the project with the annotators, uh, did you did you ask some people that have this data? And if not, do you think it could help? You know, they have synesthesia? With synesthesia. So people and then I guess it's one classical form of synesthesia like when it's people who like hear sound and they hear color. Right. I have someone like like uh, the oh this is the yellow sound and this is yeah. the purple sound. And it seems very I think the individualities, would, the individualities would make it very difficult because it's very idiosyncratic. So one person might hear blue, and the other person might hear a texture, or, or somebody else might have a number that comes up or something like that. So I mean, it's possible, but uh, no, we haven't been paying attention to that. So. Uh, I was wondering how combinatorial the problem is from a kind of a optimization perspective. It's frighteningly combinatorial. Uh, <laughs> are there many equivalent <laughs> solutions to a given per set? Uh, or how do you combine? Uh, it's one of the reasons um, you know people in machine learning don't touch the symphony orchestra. It's just, it's just simply so many sources there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, are there many equivalent solutions to a given? Uh, that's yeah. quite possible. I mean, that's, I think, where the, the sort of coming up with automatic, what we want to do in the long term is develop automatic analysis techniques and algorithms from, based on the results we get from our human analyses in a certain sense, so that we could then explore more scores uh, for those kinds of things. And that, that's where we would start uh, getting knowledge discovery kinds of things to figure out, are there some basic principles that seem to be 
operating in the way people actually do things or not. Um, because obviously, you know, the number of instruments you use in an orchestra, but you're rarely using all of them playing independently. They're like playing unison sometimes and octaves and fifths and things like that. So you start having certain kinds of constraints on the way those things are actually combined. Unless you're aiming for larger dense structures like in uh, Atmosphere by Ligeti, for example, where there the idea was to create sort of sound mass that has texture in it through all his micro polyphonies and so on. Uh, but in sort of the high classical period and a little bit more complicated in the romantic and high romantic periods, uh, I think there are certain kinds of constraints on what goes on. And another big question that, are, and this is, I think one of the hard things for young composers to learn is uh, when is adding another instrument adding nothing because it's going to be masked by all the other instruments. So I think there's a number of uh, psychoacoustic principles that need to be included in the long-term goal of uh, including this kind of thing as well. And so if you have tools that allow people to predict that kind of thing, then that would be, I think, very useful. But yeah, it's a very large combinatorial space, you're right. The minimal, minimal reduction. Uh, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, this is very interesting. And so one of the things that John Rea does uh, is he does uh, reorchestrations. He doesn't only compose, he does reorchestrations. So he took uh, Bozek, for example, and he rewrote it for an ensemble of 21 musicians instead of a full orchestra. And so a lot of the questions were, how do you get power, impact, uh, those kinds of uh, strong emotions that are going on in that, and still do it with a very small ensemble. And he did a very good job of it, and it's been uh, played all over the place. He also did, there's another piece by, uh, I think it was three pieces for orchestra by Berg, that he also did for a small ensemble. Uh, and that's being performed now all over Europe anyway, because uh, he did a very good job of it. Uh, he said he had another one where he was trying to do some opera for two celli and a harp or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> he said he wasn't sure he could get there without it. <laughs> but yeah, reorchestration, I think, is a very interesting thing. It's a, as an exercise, uh, and I've been watching, uh, following orchestration courses of Denny Boulian and John Rea, how they go about dealing with things like piano reductions. Okay, so obviously, if you have sustaining instruments, you don't have the sustain on the piano. Uh, how do you deal with things like, you can do things where you've got uh, lots of instruments playing octaves. If you try to put all that on the piano, it sounds very heavy, so how do you create lightness and things like that? So there's a lot of uh, sort of mapping that has to go on uh, to make all these things work together. But they tell us a lot about what orchestration actually means in that particular sense. Any last question? And I'll tell you my dream. Up to this point, they've been doing it with PDFs yeah. and something like uh, Preview, where they can put colored boxes, and we have different colors for different kinds of effects. But we're now working with a team that, uh, hopefully we're going to work with a team that, uh, if we get this grant, with the uh, Hochschule für Musik Detmold, where they have um, uh, Teres uh, Hadiakos, is actually working on uh, automatic score annotation on tablets. Mm -hmm. So once we get that, the idea would be the annotations would then go straight into the database because the export of grades the data. Now we have to put them in Google Forms, and so there's transcription problems, there are errors that end up happening, and it's laborious, and it takes a really long time, and it costs me lots of money because it takes a lot of time. But if we could actually automate some of that, it'd be easier for the annotators because then they could actually just say circle things, and then that would get noted and sent off straight to the database. But uh, that's still in the dream stage now. Okay, thank you very much. This concludes the second keynote. Let's uh